Um, Peter, the, um, we're going to say the floor is yours or the podium is yours or the internet is yours, but please go ahead. Perfect. Thanks, heaps, uh, Mel, and thanks very much to the organizers for the, invita the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking about energy bounds for k-fold sums in very convex sets, and everything here is joint work with Brandon Hansen and Misha Rudnev. My intention is to, to keep this with a few minutes at the end if anyone's got any questions, so please feel free to, to do so. And um, because of the time constraint, we're not going to go into any of the proofs of things, but I'm happy to talk at the end about, about um, the, the ideas. Okay, so we're talking about problems in additive combinatorics. And so the standard objects we're thinking about are some sets and energy. So consider a finite set A of reals. Um, throughout this talk, our set A will be of reals. Um, we're going to use the ordering property of the reals quite extensively. And we're going to define the sum set to be the set of all pairwise sums of elements of A. So the set of all A1 plus A2, where both have to be an element of our set A. Um, now, this is relatively easy to generalize. We could similarly define longer sums and we could also incorporate some differences in there. And they don't have to come from the same set as well. So that's quite natural. Um, there's been work in, uh, in some sets on uh, convex sets recently, uh, last year by uh, Misha Rudinev, Ali Rosh Newton and Brendan Hansen. Um, and then earlier this year, there's been some stuff with Sophie Stevens and Audie Warren. But what we're gonna be concentrating on is energy bounds, which is sort of another measure of additive structure. So the T2 energy is going to be the number of solutions to the equation A1 plus A2 equals A3 plus A4, where all of our terms are elements of some set A. Okay, now this might not be the most standard notation you're familiar with seeing. Often we write EA instead of T2A, but this two is going to refer to the fact that there are two sum ends on either side. And this is going to be the thing we're going to be generalizing with. We're going to be considering longer sums later in the talk. Now, clearly we've got some bounds on the size of the twofold additive energy. Um, I'm using this asymptotic notation, this double less than, which is just indicating that there are hidden multiplicative constants. Um, so this is not necessarily exactly true um, when I write it, but there will always be constants that we can put in to make it true. Um, and if I'm going to use that nasty word clearly, I'd better be able to justify why it is clear. Um, so for the lower bound, you'll notice that I can set A1 and A2 to be anything in A, and then set A3 to be equal to A1, A4 to be equal to A2, and we're guaranteed to get at least size of A squared many solutions to the equation. For the upper bound, um, I think in the first talk, Sean referred to these as the diagonal solutions, if, if that's more familiar to you. Um, for the upper bound, we notice that once A1, A2, and A3 are fixed, there's only one possibility for what A4 can be to make this equation true. So an upper bound is the number of uh, triples, A1, A2, and A3, of which there are size of A cubed. We then generalize this to longer sums. So this TKA is going to be the same as the T2 energy, but we're going to have K terms on each side of the equation. And again, they're still all elements of our set A. And we also got similar upper and lower bounds on the size of the K-fold energy. The lower bound, again, comes from these diagonal solutions where we just set the right-hand side to be equal to the left-hand side. And the upper bound comes from noticing that once K minus one term, two K minus one terms have been fixed, the last term is automatically determined. And we're going to say that A is additively structured if TKA and or T2A are large, as in close to their upper bounds. And the canonical example of this additively structured set is an arithmetic progression. For example, this, uh, the first n integers. And if we set A to be the first n integers, then in fact, we attain the upper bound in the two uh, 
sets of inequalities that I wrote out. So the TK energy for this set is actually roughly equal to size of h to the power of 2k minus 1. And similarly, the T2 energy is roughly equal to size of a cubed. Um, so the, we get basically the trivial upper bound if we don't put any impositions on our set A. So what we're going to do is we're going to add some more structure to it and see if we can get something, something smaller, something uh, a, a less structured additive set. So I'm going to say that my set A written in this increasing order is a convex set if the gaps between the elements are all increasing. So A2 minus A1 is less than A3 minus A2, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I put these uh, elements of A on the y-axis of a graph, and I put them into one-to-one one -one correspondence with the first n integers, then you can kind of see that we're going to be able to fit this nice smooth curve to these, uh, to these points where the curve is increasing and it's increasing at an increasing rate. Okay, well, this is gonna mean that I can rewrite my convex set A to be um, F of the first N integers where F is a convex function. And when I say a convex function, I mean that it is an increasing function and increasing at an increasing rate. Okay, now why would I want to write it like this? Well, the reason is because of a bit of sort of folklore philosophy in additive combinatorics, which is that convex functions destroy additive structure. And you'll remember from the previous slide that we, we said that the canonical example of, um, the canonical example of, a, of an additively structured set is the first n integers. And so if we hit our first n integers with a convex function, then we're going to get a set work we're expecting to be not very um, additively structured. And this is reflected in this conjecture, which is that if A is a convex set, then for any epsilon greater than zero, the T2 energy of A is bounded above by size of A to the power of two plus epsilon. In other words, um, the T2 energy is expected to be as small as it could possibly be. Um, it's a very unstructured set. Now, progress in this direction is usually um, uh, obtained in the form of proving a statement like this for different values of epsilon. And currently, the best known result is due to Shkredov, which says that if A is a convex set, the T2 energy is bounded above by size of A to the power of 32 over 13. And I write this as size of A to the power of 5 over 2 minus 1 on 26, um, because this size of A to the 5 over 2 is kind of a threshold bound, um, which can be obtained um, using, well, which has been sort of a long known bound. And um, Shkredov's improvement of 1 over 26 was sort of an incremental thing that, um, refined these approaches and introduce some other new cool ideas. So the original bound was that if A is a convex set, then the T2 energy is bounded above by size of A to the five over two. And this is gonna be particularly relevant to us because this is where um, the research that we did kind of starts from. And there are two sort of independent proofs of this from the early 2000s. One, due to Konyagin and one due to Gurev. And because their methods are so different, that's why I've included them in different colors and in different parentheses. So Konyagin's approach um, used basically incidence geometry, the semiretti trotter theorem. Uh, whereas Gurev's approach uses purely elementary uh, combinatorial arguments. Now, for a long time, it's been sort of believed that the gold standard in proving theorems like this is to use incidence geometry. Um, and this was also reflected by the fact that um, Konyagin's approach was um, seemed to be more robust because it adapted not just to the two-fold energy where um, it, it generalized this. It, it adapted to when the two-fold energy didn't include sums of two elements in the same set, but could have two different sets, say A and B. 
Um, it also uh, was easily adaptable to what I'm going to refer to later as nearly convex sets, but we'll come to that later. Um, and it sort of assumed that Gareev's approach wasn't able to be um, extended to these other settings. So the essence of our uh, research on this has been to show that Gareev's approach actually can be uh, generalized in many nice ways. And um, we've been able to recover a lot of the results or similar results to the Konyagin approach. Um, but in addition, we've been able to generalize it to longer sums in more convex sets. So let's talk about longer sums for a sec. The best known result uh, at the moment is due to Josevich, Konyagin, Rudnev, and Ten. And they showed that if A is a convex set, then the k-fold additive energy is bounded above by the size of A to the power of 2k minus 2 plus 2 to the power of minus k minus 1. And now, if you look at this superficially, pardon me, if you look at this superficially, you might be a little unsatisfied with it because the trivial bound is the size of A to the power of 2k minus 1. And so what this bound that they've obtained does is it can only ever get at most one away from the trivial bound in the power. But to think like this would be kind of erroneous because in fact, you can't do better than size of A to the power of 2K minus two as the upper bound. And this, bit, this is because we've got this nasty set A, which is the first N squares, and it actually yields the k-fold energy being roughly equal to size of a to the power of 2k minus 2. So what this means is that their result, um, their result is actually pretty close to optimal. And as k increases, it becomes sharper and sharper. OK, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, generalizing our notion of convexity. So we're going to say that a set is one convex if it's convex. We know what that means. And iteratively, we're going to say that A is an S convex set if this set of differences that we saw a couple of slides ago actually forms an S minus one convex set. So if I was to ask for a two convex set, what I need is for the gaps between our elements to be increasing but also to form a one convex set in their own right. And this gives us another way of looking at the question of uh, the k-fold energy, because if we look at the problem with obtaining better bounds for the k-fold energy in the above theorem, it's because of nasty counterexamples like the first n squares. But you'll notice that this set is a convex set but it's only just a convex set in the sense that it's a one convex set, but it's not a two convex set. And it's not a three convex set, etc. So the question is, can we improve on this by assuming that our set A is more convex, say S convex? And this is exactly what, um, what we did in our research. So the following is, our theorem. If A is an S convex set, where S is an integer greater than or equal to two, and we're going to set K to be two to the power of S. This is the number of term, the number of sum ends we have on either side of the equation. Then the K-fold energy is bounded above by size of A to the power of two K minus one minus S plus alpha S, where alpha S is this thing down here. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit. The first thing to note is that size of a to the power of 2k minus 1 is the trivial bound. So we are, what have I done there? Uh, so size of a to the 2k minus 1 is the trivial bound. So we're getting an improvement of s minus alpha s. And this alpha s is not something that we should worry about. In fact, it's kind of safe to ignore it for the purposes of this talk because it's going to be bounded below by minus an eighth and it's going to be bounded above by two. So it's, yeah, it's, it's small. And what that means is that um, 
I can get my bound here to be as far away from the trivial bound as I like by just choosing S to be large enough. In other words, by making my set S convex enough. And I'm just going to list another generalization of this. And the only modification here is that I'm no longer assuming that all my uh, sum ends come from the same set. I'm going to start with K sets, A1 up to AK, and they're all going to be S convex sets of size N. And we're going to obtain a similar bound for the energy. Now, this is not notation that I've defined, but it's, I'm hoping that it'll be kind of clear what the, what the implication is. It's the number of solutions to the energy equation where A1 and A1 prime both come from our set A1 all the way up to AK and AK prime both come from our set AK. Okay, now let's move on to nearly convex sets. This is something that uh, I mentioned a couple of slides ago, and it was something that we sort of didn't think was going to necessarily be possible. Um, but what is it all about when we're talking about nearly convex sets? Well, you'll remember this picture from a couple of slides ago and this idea that convex functions destroy additive structure. So when we say that the, when we uh, set our set A to be F of the first N integers, the reason we're expecting this not to exhibit much additive structure is because we're taking a convex function of a, an additively structured set. So when we're talking about nearly convex sets, we're going to be talking about sets where we're taking a, a convex function of an additively structured set, but not the first N integers. So we're going to set a, F to be a convex function, and now A is going to be F of B, where we're measuring our additive structure by saying that B plus B minus B is equal to K times B, the size of B. Now this k we're kind of canonically thinking as being small to say that um, to say that uh, this has got additive structure, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so what does this look like in the graph? Well, suddenly we're not taking the image of the first n integers anymore. We're taking um, our set of these bi's can be some other set, provided that it's got some additive structure. It's got this small sum set property. And our set A is going to be the image of this under our convex function. And in this case, we managed to prove that the T2 energy of A is bounded above by K to the half times the size of A to the power of five over two, which essentially matches what we had in the previous result if we were to set B to be the first N integers. But in addition, this gives us a way of quantifying how much worse our bound gets if our set becomes a little bit, when it stops exhibiting uh, additive structure. The other thing that's quite nice about this um, result is that it's actually tight. We can come up with sets, uh, a, set, a set A, which is going to be, you know, I guess a set B and a function F, where the T2 energy is actually equal to this upper bound. And this was not, uh, previously known. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention is just the big general result, which um, kind of encompasses all these things that we've talked about, not having everything in the same set, um, having small additive doubling, having longer sums. And it's not necessarily worth your while trying to read through this theorem and understand in detail what's going on. I just want to highlight some of the key points. So this is a result which gives the k-fold additive energy where all of our sets can be different. They're not, they're not S-convex sets anymore, but rather they are, um, they are the image of um, sets which have small additive doubling under S convex functions. And none of these functions have to be the same. And none of these underlying sets have to be the same. And none of the doubling constants have to be the same. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to get the same bound that we saw before when we just assumed that we had convex functions. 
um, and we're going to be able to measure how much worse this is going to get when we uh, impose uh, this further structure. Anyway, that's all, all I wanted to say. So I might end it there. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, there is time for questions. So one way to uh, do this is there is a Q and A, and uh, let's see if this works. If you type a question into the Q and A, then Peter can see it. Oh, that's what happens. Right. If not, um, let me thank Peter again for a beautiful talk. Well, and we just, uh, we just... our next speaker. Yeah. Oh, wait, we do have a we'll question. Go, we'll get a question. Yes. Can you describe the proof of this last theorem? Yeah. Okay. Actually, that's a that's a, a nice a nice point. Um, it's probably going, so the, the proof of this last theorem is kind of a generalization of the proof of this um, theorem from a couple of slides earlier. So I think this is probably the easier one to put up. All right, so the idea is, is basically this. We've got um, K terms on either side of the, okay, the point is we're gonna be doing it by induction. Induction on the number of terms on the sides of the equation. So we've got k terms on each side of the equation, and they all come from uh, s convex sets. Then what I can do is I can sort of subtract half the elements of one side and half the elements of the other side. And then what I'm going to get is differences of elements of convex sets. And now I'm going to have k over two elements on one side and k over two elements on the other side. And if I can say, well, the differences of elements of S convex sets are gonna be elements of S minus one convex sets. So we've just got to find a way of doing the bookkeeping so that we can basically say that the number of, um, the number of solutions to this equation with K terms and S convex sets is bounded in some way by the number of solutions to um, the equation with K over two terms and S minus one convex sets and then that will get our induction going. And it's actually for that reason that the interaction between the, the convexity and the number of terms on each side of the equation is, is um, uh, asymptotic, is asymptotic, is um, oh, exponential. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, it's because every time we increase in convexity by one, we double the number of terms we can, we can do. Thanks for the question. Um, when A is the set of S powers, do you re reproduce Hua's lemma? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what Hua's lemma is. I'm afraid. Someone, if someone wants to, <laughs> some someone wants to um, clarify for me what that is, then that's fine. Otherwise, I will go into the other one. Um, in the S equals one case, you mentioned that this bound is sharp. Is there a similar optimality for the S greater than or equal to two case? It doesn't, no, that doesn't appear to be. We couldn't, we, we haven't found anything sharp other than, other than basically uh, this result. Um, uh, are there analogous results for other sets? For example, ZX. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. We didn't, we didn't use that structure at all. We just used, we only used, um, the basically the ordering of the reals. Upper bound of 2k minus s. Uh -huh. uh, I think we get close to that. Uh, but but I think that we're we're off by this we're off by this um this alpha the s factor. Uh, the, this alpha s factor, which is small, but it's it's um it, it's it's bounded above by two, but it's it's like a concrete number. Um, any reason why we don't evaluate alpha s explicitly? 
this notation means yes that that's exactly what the notation means is there any reason why we don't evaluate it explicitly um i don't know i uh, we we didn't evaluate it explicitly i don't i don't i don't, I don't think we we sort of thought about it we thought you know it's it, it's small and doesn't necessarily need to be but there wasn't any reason do we have a conjectured bound on the main theorem i think that the the, just tell me when you when you stop talking, Mel. That um, the conjectured bound on the main theorem. Um, okay, so by saying that we've got an S convex set, we're going to be basically throwing away the bad examples, which are going to be the all the second powers, all the third powers, all the fourth powers, up to like the S minus one powers or something. And basically, our conjectured bounds are going to be the bounds that we get from the smallest powers that we keep in and which is which is pretty close to this i think you just drop the alpha s factor great thank you very much peter um the next talk will be sergey konyagin in three or four minutes uh, thanks, so for, peter, thanks for the good can... questions too and thanks for inviting me to speak uh, if you can stop your screen share and Sergey, if you can 